I changed the settings. So I'm here. So tell me if you can see Erica and the board. Now you guys, the board is going to be backwards, so we're going to have to read things to you. Oh. <laughs> is this our newest member, Shreya? Who's this? This is Sarah. Hey, how you doing? Hi, good to see you. Sure that's good to see you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Let's see what you guys can see. I need to see if you can see things. Chris, what do you think? Can you see that screen? Yeah, I can totally see that, Dana. Okay. Cool. All right, guys, so we're going to get started because people are on little trajectories. This is Dana J. This is our Summer Girls meeting for July 30th. Woo! is meeting it today. Hooray! Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today involving uh, system optimization. And just to give you a little introduction, a little of my background, uh, I work for a local audio production company based on the, here in the Bay Area called Sound on Stage. Uh, my specialty is systems engineering, so I wear a lot of hats because we're a small company, so everybody ends up doing a lot of things. But my passion is really like designing sound systems and deploying them. So if we're going to we're gonna go through a lot of information today. So at any point, if you guys want more clarification, feel free to stop me, ask questions. Yes? Are you going to be able to email the, the is it a PowerPoint? Thing? It's a Google Slides. I can email, I think, some of them, but okay. I, I'm using some slides that were um, loaned to me from Rational Acoustics and okay. also through some white papers that I don't know if I really necessarily have the legality to like okay. share with people cool. but uh the white papers are available on the aes website to anybody who's a member or you can pay to get them I could probably download them from yeah website. and i highly recommend reading them okay. so that's a little bit about me so let's talk about the stuff we're going to cover today so the big stuff Big things we I want you guys to walk away with is an idea of what is optimization. What does it mean to optimize a system? And we're going to talk about that in terms of the live sound environment. That is the, what I work in. And what are the different challenges that we face in the live sound environment? What are the tools that we have in order to face these challenges? And what is the science behind what's going on? And how can we use these tools to collect data and make informed decisions with our ears? Because really, it all comes down to whether it sounds good or not. We can have all these really great tools, right? But if it doesn't sound good, we don't have a show. And then uh, I also want to give you guys some educational training options at the end so you can explore and learn more right on. and hopefully you want to go and find more things thing with these, you guys everybody at home if you mute your speaker you won't then be like this is meant to be a conference right with the software but if you don't mute your little speaker there's a little mute then you'll be the front and center person and it won't be erica so make sure each of you at home mutes and if you want to ask a question then you can then you can unmute to ask okay cool yeah there we go Thank you. Is there a way you can like focus on this better so people can read the screen? I'm not sure. It's kind of bright. Let's see. It's pretty bright, but I think this one will look differently than that because I think Chris said she could see it. Okay, cool. Like go up a little higher. Although members, if they Dana, see I can see it just fine. She's great. You're good. You got. Oh, okay. thanks, Chris. I'm, I'm oh, assuming awesome. that PowerPoint will be coming in the email later, but otherwise, you're great. Hi, Erica. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start by talking about what it what is optimization. I got this from the Merriam-Webster online, and I'm just going to read it to you real quick. It says, optimization, a noun, is an act, process, or methodology of making something such as a design, system, or decision as fully perfect, functional, and possible. And I highlight the words functional and effective because I believe if you really make those two things happen, We've done our job correctly. Um, the I want to quote uh, in March. I took the official L acoustics training down in Southern California, and Scott Sugden, who's the head of U.S. touring, had this really great quote about 
would you rather have a good steak that's made of high quality meat to begin with, like Wagyu beef or Kobe beef <laughs> with just a little bit of butter on it? Or would you rather have a piece of low quality meat that's been drowned in seasoning to taste good? <laughs> You want the good, high quality. Yeah, and the, the thing I really liked about that quote is that it really illustrates that if you start with a good base for your optimization process, you're already ahead of the game before you even get to things like EQ and. Um, because EQ is really like the end of the sentence, right? There's so much more that we're going to talk about that's involved even before you get to that stage in the process. And really, we're asking ourselves, how can we do the best job with the tools that we're given? <laughs> the system functional and effective with what we have to work with. People at home, mute your, mute your microphone. <laughs> so you're yeah, yeah, because my little computer is making a ton of noise, so mute your mic at home, but welcome. Hi, this is Ben Stiegler, and I'll mute it. Hi, Ben, yeah, everybody should mute, that way, because that way it's the focus is on everything. All good. Um, that being said, I think it's important for us to define and know what are we trying to accomplish with our optimization process. And with that, knowing like your role either in the gig or uh, as your job, like what are you trying to do? Are you the front of house systems tech working with a uh, front of house engineer and your job is to make sure the mix engineer has the same show every night on a tour? Are you the, are you the mix engineer and your job is to mix the show for the band and that's your focus? Or are you the monitor engineer and you're trying to make sure the band is able to focus on their music and have the best show. So each of these processes, if you think about what you're doing in terms of what your role is at the gig, helps you make better decisions in the whole optimization process and focus on those aspects. So this will keep coming into play as we're thinking about things throughout this presentation. I always like to call this uh, who is paying my paycheck today? That is the person I want to make happy. So let's talk about the challenges we face in a live setting. Let's start with indoor venues. Uh, mm. People here in the Bay Area may recognize this venue as San Francisco so, City um, Hall, one of the oh, most yeah. challenging yeah. venues to yeah. do a show in because it sounds like you're inside of a dishwasher. Uh, and that's exactly, that's the problem with this venue because it's very highly reflective, that there's all these beautiful marble surfaces. What's that? Of course, they always do. Um, so with indoor venues, you're facing the challenges of reflective reflections from the, and the general like room acoustics both with like modes and standing waves, although with uh, bigger systems that doesn't come into play as much. But um, so you're fighting the effects of reflections in the room, but also things like trim height restrictions. Let's if you're in a, a theater that you can only bring the PA up this high because otherwise you're going to hit the proscenium of a hundred year old theater that limits uh, what you can do with the size of your array. And also uh, woof, roof weight restrictions. That's a whole nother thing too. I had a friend who was on tour in Europe and the weight of the lighting and video rig was so heavy that they had to reconfigure the entire PA to spread the load out wow. because of the roof, the roof couldn't hold all the weight. Did they really use that much lighting in the video? Really? No. It looks really cool. It looked really cool. But um, so that it's just another consideration. How did it sound? Exactly. I mean, but all this stuff is you have to think about when you're designing your array, designing your um, configuration. And then, of course, there's 
noise complaints and DB limits because everybody has the neighbor that doesn't want the concert to happen in the first place. Translations for any newbies, the live sound, line array, a group of speakers hanging together in a phase coherent manner so that they spread the sound. We will actually talk space. about line good. arrays too. Okay, good, There's good. a whole and part on it. And is decibel a measurement of amplitude? Yeah. Just in case we have some new folks to hear. It's good. I'll just toss it in. It's okay. No, please, please cool. interject. Um, and so here's some challenges of outdoor of outdoor venues as well. And you'll notice that there's overlap between the two. Obviously, you know, air absorption affects indoor as well as outdoor. <laughs> but the ch but the consequences of both are very different, right? When you're outdoors, uh, you don't have the like, here's one way that reflection is actually work in your favor, right? You're in an indoor venue and you have the added gain structure, whether that's good or bad from the reflective walls, adding that extra volume to your system, whether that's good or bad. But then when you're outside at a festival, that high frequency content is just going out and never to be seen again. <laughs> it's true. It's like, bye! <laughs> right? And then uh, temperature and humidity changes. Uh, a lot of big festivals happen in extreme weather, cli weather climates where yeah. it'll be really hot during the day and really cold at night. And that's- Looking at you outside lands. Right, exactly. Yes, absolutely, yeah. That temperature change has a effect on the physical properties of sound. Um, and, if, and then there's limited options for placement. Uh, if you're if you're working on a pop-up stage, there might be only a certain place you can actually hang the sound system mm -hmm. due to uh, weight restrictions again. So you can only put the PA in one place. How does that affect your ability to optimize the system? And then of course, noise complaints and DB limits because everyone has the neighbor that doesn't want the show to happen in the first place. So there are a lot of factors here uh, both in the indoor and outdoor venues. And what we have to think about how can we adapt, e adapt to each of these different situations. And the key for me, the key I believe is building a good workflow. Um, sometimes we have a whole day to set up, tune a sound system, make it sound great. And sometimes you have five minutes to do it depending on like maybe the truck arrived late and so everything is pushed back like a two or three hours but being decisive uh trying to do as much as you can on the front end of your work really helps you to optimize your system even before you get to the day of show and re repeating be, we're trying to build some sort of consistent workflow, doing the same thing gig to gig helps you maintain that level of consistency. And it's always good, I think, to remember to know what you do and do not have control over, right? Like, can we really control the reflections in the room? Well, probably not if they don't have the budget to do acoustic treatment. Or if you're in there on a tour and you're just doing a show for a day, uh, that's not, not something you have control over. So how do we make this the best? How can you make this the best you can working with what we have? And fortunately, modern technology has a lot of tools available to us so that we can do a lot of work even before the truck gets unloaded. And I will just as a disclaimer, these are all like good things to work towards and to keep in mind. Do I always follow them? No, I'm notorious for being OCD about certain things uh, at gigs, but it's always good to sort of try and keep these things in mind to work ourselves to being better, right? And it all kind of goes back to making our decisions. Are we being functional or effective with each of these decisions in the optimization process? So how are we going to build a good workflow? And if we, how are we going to build that good quality stake to begin with? Yeah, no, just going back to it. <laughs> so there's a lot we can do even before we get to the gig. Uh, in like pre-production, 
uh, doing site surveys, figuring out where we can actually set up the speakers, uh, assessing the client's needs. What kind of show is this? Are we doing a spoken word event? Are we doing a rock show? Uh, trying to figure out what the, what is this, the situ, what do we need for this certain situation? Because maybe the same PA you'd have for a rock show would work for spoken word, but is it really necessary? And once we do all our pre-production, we can look at the design aspects of it. A lot of the loud, a lot of the big major manufacturers now have modeling software that you that's proprietary through their speakers, and you can build your entire venue uh, system in the computer world and see what it's going to do in the see what's going to do offline before you even hang, hung a single motor really cool right and you have the ability to adjust things like display angles placement and really be a sound designer in all these realms and make these decisions to try and get it to the behavior the mechanical behavior of the speakers to work as best as possible even before you get to the gig and then once you've built a good design, you can start looking at things like deployment. Are we using the right amplifiers? Are we using the right cable gauges? Um, do we have the correct rigging to make this happen? Um, I think, and it's always good to remember the aspect of design versus reality, right? We come up with this really amazing, <laughs> perfect plan that we're gonna deploy. And then how many people have done a gig and you, you advanced like one setup and you get to the gig and it's completely different from yeah. what you expected. Yeah. Everybody, everybody does. Never ever happens. Never happens. <laughs> Never. Depending so, on how big your budget is, of course. What's that? Depending on how big your budget is, of course, or lack thereof. Depending on how big <laughs> your budget is. But I mean, yeah. well, what the, Part of our job, right, is being able to adapt to each situation. So that's part of building our optimized design as well. So as you can see, there's all this stuff we can do to start with that high quality steak. And even before we get to the EQ process, because really EQ, hi. Hi, hi I'm Erica. Hi, I'm Maya. Nice Sorry. to meet you. No, it's all good. Um, we're just talking about um building the optimization process and trying to build a front end your work front end load your work to make the best possible system even before you get to the stage of eq because eq is really the final step because you can't eq a pillar out of the middle if it's in front of the speaker right <laughs> you can't it's not a solution to me eq is not a solution to a mechanical problem hmm. so that being said it's important to remember with all this that there's not a right answer and this kind of all goes back to uh knowing what our role in the gig is right um Who's the person that we're designing this system for? Is, are we the front, like I said, the front of house systems engineer trying to make sure the mix engineer has the same show every night? Well, we're probably gonna make the system sound a certain way because that's what the front of, that front of house engineer wants to have every single day. And so I, I like to quote, um, Jamie Anderson, who's one of the owners of Rational Acoustics, and he said he actually owns the company that makes Smart. And he says there's no such thing as smarting a PA. There's only like Erica ing a, a PA, Jamie ing a PA, <laughs> Dana ing a PA. Everyone's going to make different aesthetic decisions on how to tune a sound system based on their yeah. own qualitative choices, right? Yeah. So we can all breathe now. Hey, you're, you're doing okay. It's all gonna be okay. But if we remember what we're trying to accomplish and think about and think about that in making these decisions, we can start thinking about all the different tools that we have at our disposal and how we're gonna use them to make to get our job done. 
So what tools do we have at our disposal to help us collect data and make our, help our ears make informed decisions? Uh, informed decisions. Uh, as I said earlier, a lot of the major manufacturers now have modeling software. A lot of them are available for free online that you can just download. Uh, and you can build your entire venue and system uh, offline to, and see what it's going to do even before you get to the gig. And there's construction tools like range finders, measuring tapes, distos to take measurements of the venue so you can build it in modeling software. And then of course there's you know, high quality measurement microphones uh, and measurement analysis software like Smart, Sim, Sistune. Uh, all these things allow us to collect really scientific accurate data if used properly to help our ears make informed decisions because really the best tool we all have is our ears. And that's with us all the time, right? I like that. That's a good one. That's a giant right side. Giant right. We're really listening on that one. So I know a lot of people are interested in like building measurement systems. So I wanted to sort of have like a slide of the different options sort of available now because the really cool thing is that there's a wide variety of options now, ranging from the inexpensive to the more pricey options. Mm -hmm. And the key to remember about all these different uh, devices is that they can all get the job done if you know how to use them properly and consciously. For example, I own four of the Behringer ECM 8000 mics. They're about $60. Um, I don't care if somebody knocks them over on the ground as much as my iSymphon mic, but I can still get really good data with those mics, even though they may not be like, uh, have the same perfect frequency response as maybe like an Earthworks mic, because I can take averages of all that data and still get really valuable information out of them. Um, and then on the other hand, I have an iSymphon EMX 7150, which is a, a flat frequency response mic about equivalent to the Earthworks M30. And that's, it's a great mic to have just when I'm doing, when I can only have time to use one microphone to run around. So all these tools, all these microphones do the same job. It's just a matter of knowing how to use them properly to get that, to get the data that you need. Similarly with uh, audio interface devices. There's a lot of great options now from the, you know, $150 Focusrite 2i2, which is a great little two channel interface, to um, Roland OctaCapture, I which I have for doing multi mic averaging, because it's the uh, eight mic threes, I believe. And, but now, the cool thing is uh, a lot of these big manufacturers now are trying to keep the, make their systems more in-house by releasing these devices that do all the measurements within their, um, within their own systems. Like Meyer Sound has SIM for taking measurements and working with, the, my, with Meyer Sound equipment, which I think you were, said you were yeah, familiar yeah. with, right? Yeah. And um, in April of this year, L Acoustics just released the P1, which is a front end processor, audio bridge, um, matrix, mixer, everything. And it does all the networking, uh, processing of L Acoustics gear wow. and measurement stuff within their, their device. So all these manufacturers, are, they're trying to make your job easier. They want to give you the tools so that you can succeed. So it's important to learn how to use these devices to get that data and, and help you achieve your job. And this slide's just kind of for fun because there's, you know, even wireless, <laughs> wireless systems, that. right? <laughs> You can go anywhere from having a wireless electrosonics for when you don't want to run 400 feet of cable in an arena, or you can have your helpful assistants run your microphone around for you. Thank you, stagehands of the world. I have a follow-up.
Like, oh. Hey now, I resemble that remark, Erica. <laughs> wow. So I think it's, uh, as you can see here, there are tons of options available for, to, for you to help. And they're all tools that you can use to help with this optimization process. And, and so now the question is, how do we collect data and what is the meaning behind the data that we're collecting? Sorry, can I just ask real quick? Yeah. What was that? That middle one looked wireless? Yeah. Uh, this is a it's new a contender on the market. On market. Yeah, the Mi Pro. It's uh, just like the Electrosonics. It's a transmitter and receiver that's uh, real high quality, companding free, and uh, of comparable quality, lesser price than the Electrosonics. Huh. A lot of... Uh, people on forums and stuff have been saying good things about them, so. Okay, sorry, I, it's easier to see, that's wireless, anyway, see wireless up top now, I'm like looking at them and not, gotcha, actually, wireless. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> that big word. word over there, it says <laughs> wireless. wireless. Yeah. Yeah. And now, to Ooh, science. science. Let's get, getting into the meat, meaty greedy of things. So I want to talk about these three formulas because they're going to come up again and again throughout your career and, and this presentation, but you'll see them again and again. So you should drill them in your brain forever. Uh, the first one's pretty obvious, pretty obvious Ohm's law and important for specking generators, anything from specking generators to understanding how cable gauges are important to, um, to just understanding how your amplifiers or any sort of electronic circuit is working. Ohm's law is pretty important. And then the big heavy hitter that we're going to talk about a lot today is uh, the period of a wave is inversely proportional to frequency. That one is going to come a lot, come up a lot. And then of course wavelength, because wavelength being the speed of sound divided by frequency. And <clears throat> thinking about wavelength too, we should also remember that we work with a really large scale factor in audio compared to a lot of other industries. Like we're, we're working with wavelengths that are anywhere from like the size of a building to the size of a penny. So there's a lot of variables that affect uh, everything you're working with when you're working on such a wide scale as uh, the wavelengths in the audio world. So let's take a moment here to refresh our memories about phase and the relationships and that they play with one another by going back to our friend, the sine wave. Dun, da, da. <laughs> so this is just a little refresher. I'm sure all you guys know this stuff, but um, it bears repeating because it's going to play an important role in everything we kind of talk about from here on out. So here we've got our friend, the sine wave. So starting at zero degrees, beginning of the wave, and 360 degrees at the end of the wave, with the top of the crest here being 90 degrees and the bottom of the crest being 100, or, uh, 170 degrees and the null point in the middle being 180 degrees. Now, this is basically a graphical representation, right, of air, air molecules mo moving back and forth. So if we think about it in terms of constructive and destructive interference, um, we think uh, that we remember that when we have two waves that are starting at, that are added together with both zero degrees of phase offset, uh, they actually add together and you get plus six dB of summation. So if we draw, we're gonna go here and draw what we call the phase wheel. So here's zero degrees or 360 degrees. Here's our null point of 180 degrees. And when you add uh, two waves together with zero degrees phase offset, we actually get, we get six dB of summation of the two signals together. And then of course, when we add two waves that are 180 degrees offset, we get uh, infinite 
uh, null, right? With the, they completely cancel themselves out or close to infinity. So, but then there's this kind of, there's this region um, uh, 100, at 120 degrees plus or minus uh, at 120 degrees where you get three, you get about anywhere up to 3 dB of addition. Between uh, between these two points, right? This is 120 degrees on either side, and then at the, and then there's this region kind of here on either side of 180 degrees where you get weird destructive interference going on when you add these <coughs> waves together. Is everybody following me? Do you guys see how you know understand how this uh, summation and how this relates to? Uh, wheel, we're all, we're all there. You can ask a question if you need to, too. Yeah, feel free online if you need uh, any clarification. Okay, so it's basically like whatever um, the degrees of two waves with each other is going is going to factor in whether or not it's constructive or destructive interference, essentially. Yes, the position of the, of the two signals and their how much phase offset they have from one to another is going to play a huge role in whether they're constructive or destructive. Okay, cool. Thank you. So by knowing this, by understanding this relationship between signals, it helps us how determine uh, how these way, how these two how signals are going to interact. Can I just ask a question? Yeah, I'm not super familiar with this stuff. In that first example at the plus, um, they equal, is that just a more exaggerated way? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're you, basically, since there's no uh, time offset between the two, you're getting an increase in amplitude of the two waves. So they're adding together to make a bigger wave. I see. And the other one, um, when you say they're canceling each other out, is that, but you, you can still hear them. So that's destructive now? It's disruptive, but you actually, like if these were exactly the same frequency, I'm just gonna pick something random here, like a, a 100 Hertz wave, sine wave, and you added them with a 180 degrees completely offset, you probably wouldn't, you would hear very little sound. Wow. Yep, because of that offset. Because imagine it's like, here's the crest of this wave, and this guy is exactly the opposite of it. And so when they add together, they're nullifying. Last question, what makes some of them start by going up and some of them start by going up? Ah, time. From change in time. And we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, more in a minute here and a little bit later. Yes, it's all uh, phase is a, a relationship to time. Um, another quick question, because this is looking kind of familiar from a live sound class that I did. Um, I would hope so. <laughs> it's for me, yes. <laughs> um, it's kind of reminds me. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, thank God I had a competent teacher. But this is, I remember, it was a while ago, but I'm remembering something about how um, cables have, like, a grounding, something with grounding in them where it's, like, the 180, they're, like, the signals, like, reversed of each other and then that's what helps like ground it out. I think I'm remembering something about that, but I don't think I'm remembering what it is correctly. A little different. Um, kind of yeah, yeah, I think you're thinking of uh, like someone describing how phase works in terms of electrical, electrical phase. Electrical yeah. phase oh, probably. Three phase power. Yep. And power. that's that's kind of different. That's more that has to do with like balancing the load back on the neutral. And okay. We won't really. I'm not going to really get into that. Yeah. That's more electric, dealing with like electricity rather than like acoustics. Yeah. This is okay. this is that's electronic, but I mean that's all the same math essentially. Okay. But <laughs> we're talking about a graphical representation of sound pressure level of, of air molecules moving back and forth. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good questions you guys have, yeah. So how does this apply to our friend, the line array? This, uh, this image here is from a great book I recommend everyone reading, uh, Bob McCarthy's book, Sound System Design and Optimization. 
And one of the things he talks about here is how um, in a line source, and let's, we're talking in, with these specific examples of an array of speakers in a line uh, shooting out from one another. In this, in this picture, it's actually uh, eight speakers. Um, the farther you go out in distance, the more the more all these elements are going to start overlapping and interplaying with one another. So the relationship that they have either in phase in phase and time is going to start mattering more the further out you get in distance, right? Because here you, you, in this picture you see on one level of what he calls the, the parallel pyramid. Um, you have eight single speakers and then progressively move further off into distance, in the distance, more and more of these speakers are starting to interact with, with one another, where you have suddenly, you know, seven two-way crossovers. And when we talk about crossover here, we're not talking about a uh, electronic crossover, like in um, DSP, we're talking about an acoustic crossover where two uh, systems are meeting, right? So you have to, acoustic crossover of two speakers or each of these speakers um, interacting more and more the further away you get up until a certain point in the distance you have all eight of those speakers in your line uh, interacting as one and they're essentially becoming one giant speaker or a point source right and so all the whether you're having constructive or destructive interference the further you get is really going to start to matter to you, right? And how it sounds. The joke <laughs> is that's why they call it the cheap seats. And the further away you are, the worse it sounds. Or, or not so much anymore. Right? <laughs> now it's getting better. Because as you can see here, here's a better illustration. Um, the constructive and destructive interference, whether it's good or whether it's good or bad in that scenario, is create will decide whether you're getting coupling zones or isolate or isolating zones between the speakers the further you move away see how all the the wave patterns are interacting more and more the farther out you go um, and we also so this behavior also is illustrated <coughs> in under in Fresnel zones when we talk about line array behavior so we can also see how this uh, so constructive and destructive interference of waves plays an important role in line, array, line arrays by looking at uh, Fresnel zones. So in 1992, the Marcel Urban and Christian Heil wrote a really great AES paper called Wavefront Sculpture Technology, which is what a lot of the electrostics technology <laughs> is based off of. And they revised it in 2003 uh, if you're going to read one of the papers, I recommend reading the 2003 one because it's got a lot more, it's got a lot less math and more explanation in it. But they found that this correlation between near field and far field behavior and how it relates to line length, frequency, and distance. And it's all based on uh, understanding the engineering behind optics because. Uh, Christian Heil was a particle physics engineer, I believe, specializing in, late, in uh, optics. And he, they found that in the near field, um, sound waves propagate in a cylindrical manner up to a certain point, which they called the D border. And when, ooh, I have a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> The Heil man, the guy that mixed the microphone? No. No, no? different person. Okay. Different person. But he was, wasn't also, he was also a system engineer, though. He created like, okay. the first loud PA. <laughs> he really did. Like, oh, PAs were not loud system. until he started building PA systems for the Who was the first guy that did one, uh, the, the one that did Woodstock? What's the guy's name? Well, I don't remember. The, the founder of like loudspeakers and stuff. What the hell is his name? Not Cliff. That was um, no. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I can't. I'll think just, go, but I just read about him, and now I'm brain farting. All good. Um, so basically, they found that um, in up until a certain point, which they called the the D border, you have this near field behavior where sound propagates between three dB 
of loss per doubling of distance, which is contrary to what we know with the inverse square law, right, where you get 6 dB per doubling of distance. So that behavior starts happening when you get into this far field behavior here, past that DB, that D border. Um, then you get the sound propagation moves from being cylindrical to being uh, spherical. So it's radiating out, and then you're starting to get that 6 dB loss per doubling of distance. And let's see. So, so, and our goal here is to maintain the our, to maintain the uh, listener in that near field behavior, because in that at that point they're only getting three dB loss per doubling of distance. So you're maintaining that tonal quality for a longer period of time of the array. And like it, let's be clear here: we're still talking about a straight line source. So all the speakers in a straight line. Um, <clears throat> so they also just found out that if you draw an arc from the observer here along the main axis of the radiating source, anywhere along this line, which this, uh, this line being that distance, that D, bo D border, to that D border, anywhere you, any source that you place along this line is going to be in phase at a certain frequency. And then once you get that distance plus half a wavelength of that uh, frequency under scrutiny, you start having, uh, then the signal, the frequency is out of phase. So what you end up getting are these alternating rings of in phase and out of phase that actually have play a huge role in the directionality of your PA and how far that near field behavior starts to happen. That's why if um, have if you sometimes if you're in like a concert and you go to like the very top of the balcony and you'll get, you'll and you like lean down and you can hear that you're in that near field behavior and you're like, oh, it sounds great. And then you stand up and you're like, oh, it sounds terrible. <laughs> because what happens is once you get at the edge of the, the, once you get at the edge of the array, when you're out, when it's outside of that Fresnel zone, you get that weird, can't, you get weird interactive effects because of this interplaying constructive destructive interference of all these waves, right, happening. So this effect both helps us because it allows us to control how far of a, of a distance we have in near field behavior. And we can also manipulate how far that distance can be. Similarly, they uh, also found out that there's no near field frequencies lower than a third of the height of the array. So this gets, this, we're gonna get into some math here. This means that the line length of the array, so how, t how long the actual array is, will determine the lowest frequency that it can reproduce and put the listener in the near field. So in this example here, they have a 5.4 meter a uh, line source. So the lowest frequency that it can reproduce and still put the listener in the near field experience is about 63 hertz. And we can we could do the math about around that, right? Because if it's um, the near field is one third uh, the height, the lowest frequency is one third the height of the array, and this is in meters, right? So one third times 5.4 is I think 16.2. One divided by 16.2 is 0 0.0062. And this is in kilohertz. So this is <laughs> true. We love it. Seriously, oh, girl. Just, like, quickly doing all that. I, I'm like, I actually you? did this math ahead of time. Ah, so I knew what that Pre-production. Pre-production. <laughs> So, so <laughs> then that, if this is kilohertz, if this is 0. 0.0062 kilohertz, that ends up being 62 hertz. So yeah. the lowest frequency that um, 
a 5.4 meter height array can reproduce in the near field is 62 hertz. Now, of course, we all know, we know that low frequencies are hard to control just in general anyway, but the important inf information to gather here is that this, that's the lowest frequency that we can control the directivity behavior going outward, right? So the longer your line length is, the more boxes you have in your array, the further out you can, <clears throat> the further out you can push this deep, this uh, border here. Yeah, where's my, where's my pointer? Where is he? There we go. The further out you can push that D border to. But how often do we see an array that's just like a bunch of straight yeah. speakers? Yeah. Never, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> With a couple like exceptions of, of uh, designs and whatnot. Um, but we have the ability to adjust the line length, not just with adding more boxes, but also by, uh, by adjusting the curvature of the array. So, so by adding curvature, we can actually, by adding curvature and messing with the splay angles in between each of the elements of the array, we can actually put more of this line by bending it into that first Fresnel zone. This is more of a line array type of thing, right? Because I'm an, I'm really hanging up Claire Brothers, which were literally straight boxes, and you couldn't really change the curve. It was straight up and down, and you know it was splayed out. But this is, is this more of like a line the array? J, J arrays, which the which huh? was the J array, which is the new style of line. Arrays. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're yeah. Oh, this is this is more of a line yeah. array type of. Thing that you're talking about. Yes, we're talking, I'm talking specifically about line okay, source sorry, arrays with, <laughs> with a, where you can adjust the I angles just, between I, the elements. I just in my head, I was thinking how does that work with other ones, but it doesn't. So it says line arrays. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. That's good. Can sorry. you keep it aside? No, no, it's awesome. Time. It's good. No problem. Wow. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> so. <laughs> So what have this kind of, what have we learned sort of from this? We have, so not only do we have these tools that we can analyze our array, but knowing kind of the science behind the mechanics of how line array, the array works, we have different mechanical options that we can change, including the line length for the application. So we can add boxes to create a longer line length to give us more directionality over a wider frequency response of the array, uh, or we can adjust splay angles to mess with the curvature array to make it go farther, and to control beaming effects when um, that you have as you increase that box count, right? And things like trim height, how and how far away the the this the relate the distance relationship between the audience and the speaker. All of these are different mechanical ways of optimizing your design, even before we've gotten to the step of EQ. So now the question is, how can we measure, now we've mechanically optimized our design to make it the best we can, what can, how can we measure what we've done? What are the things that we can measure? So let's start by examining how the measurement tools actually capture data. Um, what's and in order to know uh, what how this data actually is collected, let's first look at the different systems we can measure. So, here's a gig I did recently that I think is the same picture as the beginning one. No, this is different actually. Um, this is the Greek theater, and you have. Wait, there's no pointer. Come back, pointer. You've got your mains, left, right systems. We've got some flown subs here. We've got a outfill left and right. We've got some front fills and ground supported subs. So let's kind of go back to what we were, excuse me. Is that subs across the front there with front fills on and then subs on the deck? Uh, there's subs, there are cardioid subs on the ground here. Okay. And then the front fills are on the deck. And, and there's still some subs along the sides there. Oh, no, that's just um, okay. drape. Gotcha. Okay. 
or yeah, a puppy barricade. Anything black would just be yeah, but the so each of these systems has a purpose. Like, what are we trying? The let's think about what each of these array, each of these arrays are trying to do. Whether it's the main systems, the outfills, or the subs, each of them has their own purpose, and we have to make and knowing what they're trying to do at the gig helps us figure out uh, how we're going to analyze it. So when we're looking at what we're each system, we have to make a decision of how we're going to measure it. Measure it. And there's sort of two big uh, measurement methodologies that exist these days. First of them being a single channel analysis, which uh, the first example that comes to mind is an RTA. How many people have used an RTA in their life? Everybody. Real-time analyzer. So the thing with an RTA or any form of single channel analysis is that you can only uh, look at frequency, you can only look at it in rel relation to some There's no um, comparison between two different systems. It's all in reference to some absolute value whether it's frequency, content, and amplitude, um, you're not comparing two different things and seeing a change here. Whereas opposed, if you want to see that difference, you have to use some sort of dual channel analysis to compare two different si uh, signals in the system and uh, what the difference is. And that usually requires a measurement uh, in comparison to a reference. And by doing that, with we can take a transfer function of the, of the two divide, of the two signals. And the most common way of measuring of doing a transfer function of, me, of a measurement versus some sort of reference is we're usually measuring uh, the input of a system versus the output, right? So the reference being whatever the input is into the system versus what you're measuring in the output most common way transfer function we're probably doing here. So what is the, what are the measurement systems doing? What, um, well, how are they collecting this data? Um, many of the measure, <clears throat> excuse me, measurement softwares that you use, uh, use FFTs to translate time domain data into the frequency domain. That being said, what the hell is an FFT? <laughs> uh, I would like to point out that this, a lot of this information is stuff that I've gathered from the Rational Acoustics training course. So I highly recommend taking it if you wanna go even more in depth into FFT and, and all that. But uh, you know, the way that measurement systems take uh, time domain data and translate it into the frequency domain is by using a fast Fourier transform. So this guy in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, figured out, uh, John Baptiste Fourier, figured out that all complex, all complex waves can be broken and down into individual sine waves. So the sound of me talking, the sound of the light buzzing, that complex wave that's a time domain information, that signal, can actually be chopped up and broken down into individual sine waves of all the frequency components, right? So in order, to, and the way that you do that is with a mathematical formula called a Fourier transform. Thank goodness we have computers to do this for us, <laughs> right? <laughs> The trick is that when you're taking, then we're, when we're looking at, when we're using FFTs to look at time domain data, we need to look at it in relation to frequency too, because the longer wavelengths that we're trying to, uh, to look at and analyze, we need a longer time constant in order to do that. So we have to take a measurement over a longer period of time. And this all comes back to our formula that will keep coming up again and again forever in your life. Frequency being inversely proportional to the period of a wave. So 
in order to, if we're going to take data of a longer wavelength, we need to have a longer FFT to get that same amount, the same amount of data. But fortunately, now it used to be that uh, computers would have to, it took so much processing power to do these measurements that you'd have to like choose one FFT size for one frequency range and have another computer do another FFT. Then you have to combine all the information and interpret it somehow. But thanks to modern processors, a lot of this, all this software can do it within uh, you know, one computer. Hooray, technology. <laughs> <laughs> so all these FFT measurements help us look at, uh, we can take time domain data and look at what's going on in the frequency range of our different systems. So well, what are some things that we can look at with our measurement software? Let's uh, start with a, a good example of the comb filter. Are comb filters good or bad? It all kind of depends, right? Some examples being ground bounce, ref reflections. A comb filter is essentially two signals arriving at the same location with some degree of time offset, right? So let's say you're, you set your measurement mic here on the ground and you're playing pink noise through a speaker and you're getting, you're probably going to get the signal from the, the direct signal from the loudspeaker hitting that microphone, but you're also getting the signal uh, of it bouncing off the ground into the microphone as well. And that, that change in delay in time is actually equivalent to a certain frequency. Why is it equivalent to frequency? Because it all comes back to the formula you'll remember forever and ever. So yes. if you have one millisecond of time offset, that is equal to a one kilohertz comb filter, right? Because one divided by point, because uh, that formula, I should, it's, it said it earlier, uh, period of wave is in seconds. So one divided by 0 0.001 is 1000 Hertz or one kilohertz. Now, what does this mean? This means that every time you add a delay into a system, you're creating a comb filter at some frequency. So important information to remember, every time you add delay into a system, you are creating a comb filter at some frequency. I mean, this is kind of how EQs actually work, right? The actual EQ filter is your, it takes some amount of delay and adds a, reproduces the wave and adds it to the system to create a comb filter and get rid of that frequency or add that frequency and have that effect. So comb filters come up everywhere. Any time you introduce a time F offset between two signals. So here's an example data. This is actual data that I've taken in the wild. Let's look at some <laughs> Let's look at these comb filters in the wild. So here you have a, a full, ra full range loudspeaker. And you look at this and you first think, oh my god, what is, what is going on here? There's all these like peaks and valleys or something horribly wrong with this mic position. So you know, so we move the microphone. And we're like, oh, there's even, there are all these more peaks and valleys, but they've moved a little bit. What is going on here? So this is a classic reason why you don't just start like EQing right away with, uh, when you start seeing these, uh, seeing stuff like this happen. Because this is, so here's all the traces sort of added, uh, all the traces put together and uh, different mic positions. The, notice how each of the peaks and valleys keep kind of moving and are micro, mic position dependent, right? So you can't just make a judgment call. Um, it, it's hard, or I shouldn't say you can't. It's, you ha it's hard to make a judgment call of what's going on from a system just based on one particular point in space because there's a lot of other factors kind of adding to it, right? So it's in this situation, it's better to take an average of all these measurements to see, to kind of randomize those, uh, 
reflections, that that's actually what's going on here. Each of these, each of these dips is a comb filter created by uh, the ground bounce. This was data taken in a venue, uh, totally empty, and the floor is all hard concrete, just like uh, this floor. So you're getting the bounce off the floor into the microphone, and the only way to sort of see what's happening underneath that is to take an average of all that data and look at the overall trend to random and to randomize those room reflections. So that trend says a lot of bass buildup, right? Uh, yes, but so here's another thing, right? We think about there's this sort of focus, I feel like, on making a like flat sound system. Oh, we're trying to EQ it to be perfectly flat, but our ears aren't perfectly flat, right? They're logarithmic in how we hear. And so like a system that's like quote unquote perfectly flat doesn't usually sound necessarily great to our ears. So a lot of the manufacturers have either like frequency or response curves that you try and either like retain or work the, to optimize the system towards or going back to our previous kind of the earlier discussion about um, who are you tuning the system for like a lot sometime what I do is I like have certain frequency curves that I like oh wow this sounded really good today and I'll keep a trace of that and then try and match that on another show so that you have some reference point right to like work back to So looking at that data, we were able to see a time offset between the two separate signals in that comb filter and try and come up with a solution. And the solution kind of depends on what's causing that comb filter, right? I know it was a uh, ground bounce because I was there in that situation, but what, what really caused it? Is it ground bounce? What's the solution to that? Add an audience. <laughs> uh, is it the comb filter caused by two systems that are too close that are close to one another and they're interacting a lot and creating uh, creating a null at certain frequencies maybe move the speakers or delay one system so that they're working more in time and in phase or is it uh, the, is it the comb filter caused by room reflections interacting with your system maybe get acoustic treatment if that's something in your budget or find a different venue. Ah. <laughs> We're moving pipe the dreams. It's all pipe, pipe dreams. dreams, exactly, right? <laughs> Glad you guys laughed at that one. Like Yay. <laughs> so another example of data that we can collect with our measurement devices is we can look at phase offsets. Now, the most common example being looking at subs to mains timing uh, or looking at subarrays. So it's, we remember here thinking about, thinking about a phase in correlation to time that every, any frequency is going to be in phase at some point in time, right? So when you're making these decisions about phase, lining up your phase traces or making some sort of timing decision, you have to choose a point in space to make these decisions, right? So here's, um, before we then talk about that phase, I want to also <coughs> talk about the difference between a phase relationship and a polarity reversal. I think someone was talking, was somebody talking about polarity reversals online yeah. earlier? Yeah. yeah. With that, or no, she was talking about with AC current, but maybe this is kind of related to that because here, this is really hard to see in black, but there's another trace right here. This is the phase, this is the phase when phase window right here. So you have 180 plus 180 degrees minus 180 degrees on the y axis. And then you have frequency on the bottom here. Because remember the Fourier, the FFT is taking time domain information and, and breaking it down by frequency. So uh, these are phase traces of two different two subs of two subs. One of them's here in this hard to see curve, and it has a flat frequency or 
not frequency response, a flat phase trace uh, between like 63-ish and 130 hertz, right? And then this other trace is 180 degrees of a polarity reversal. So both of these are completely uh, 180 degrees offset. And the difference between a polarity reversal versus a phase, some sort of phase offset is that there's no time component with a polarity reversal. It's an electrical thing, like you take the two pins on an XLR and you flip them the other way. There's no time component in there. That's just an electrical thing. Like, I don't know, some, somebody wired the sub backwards inside the drivers and you're like, oh. <laughs> or bust out the screw gun. <laughs> And then, but then that's compared to um, a lot like a phase offset. So here we've got two, two systems, a sub and a full range speaker. This pointer, where are you? I almost had it. There we go. I'm trying to get there, guys. Is it black? So yeah, I think oh, it's weird. So press the pointer thing again. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah. Now we've got our pointer back. So, so here we have this purple trace is our full range speaker, and you can kind of see the phase trace right here. Uh, versus the subwoofer, which is over here. So there's some amount of time offset between these two systems that's visible in the phase trace here. And so we can, uh, we can change that and uh, adjust for it by adding time into the system, adding time to one system or the other. In this case, the, sub the mains are actually lap, uh, lagging in time compared to the sub. So we would add some either, we would either flip the sub out of phase and add a little bit of time. When I say flip the sub out of phase, I use the wrong term myself. Flip the polarity of the yeah. subs to try and put them back in, back in time or forward in time and then add more to line them up with the mains or maybe we would add more some time delay to the mains, whichever one would be the least amount of time, right? Because remember going back, the more, every time we add time to our system, we're creating some sort of filter at a given frequency. So whatever is the least amount of time is gonna be the way to go here. Bye Heather. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you for sticking around. Um, we're almost done here. And so as I can see with looking at, we can look at the phase relationships between two systems and look at time, the time relationship that we extrapolate from that and see some sort of offset between the two systems and accommodate for it using things like DSP, adding delay time, all these are things that we can control with our processors and the technology that we have. Is that a stupid question? Uh, what's that? What TSP? Digital TSP. signal processing. So, like any processors that you know, that like your sense. lakes, your. I remember. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So to conclude all this, we can where we've kind of dived into here is that our optimization process really begins with addressing mechanical issues in the system. We starting all the way from our pre-production, thinking about how we can uh, optimize our system even before we get to the EQ process. And a lot of the modern technology that we, is available to us allows us to collect data and make better decisions and help our ears using this technology. So if we prioritize what's important to us, we can use the tools to help us make these better decisions and build our workflow that works best for us. So 
I hope that I got you at least excited enough to want to learn more about the technology available to you and take class and all this. I've got uh, this I'll definitely share. There's a bunch of classes, resources from different manufacturers you can take. All L Acoustics, DNB, Meyer, all have training courses. Uh, Bob McCarthy's book is that you can get on Amazon and read and subscribe to the AES e library. It's a great resource too. And uh, learn from each other. I'm always learning from fellow engineers, like new tech, new information, sharing, uh, sharing data. And from Sound Girls. That's and from Sound Girls. <laughs> so thanks guys. Oh, yeah. awesome. You are really, really Oh my God, she's a great teacher. Having a sound teacher, you're not just thinking about it. Really awesome. Yeah, well, do you guys have questions? I would love to answer any questions. Yeah, feel free. There's going to be a couple of announcements. I want to carry to talk a little bit about this online class she's got available to sound girls for me, which is really cool. Yeah. So, why are you working with you this weekend? Not good questions. There's a good question. No. Are you doing, you're not doing any more, are you? I don't, it's 19th this last I was kind of excited to hear that Greg wasn't doing any more. You guys Sorry. stay with us because we got a couple of announcements we'll mention as well. Folks at home. Does anybody have any questions about the presentation? <laughs> I know it's a lot of like, it's a lot of math and a lot of information that I'm still absorbing. Yeah. But system engineering is, we were talking, Carrie and I before, when you're an FOH or a monitor engineer, this stuff isn't in your wheelhouse no. and doesn't necessarily have yeah, to be. Yeah, but if you're the systems tag, yeah. you gotta well, know it. So, it. but at the same time, like, part yeah, of the- I have knowledge of it. Too. Oh, it's good to know, absolutely. But some don't, right? There's a lot of people out there doing, doing FOH and not in huge setups, but in, in smaller setups. And they don't necessarily know, even though it's better to know. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things yes, I was right, trying too. to get across too in the beginning yeah. is it's like, what what actions can you take to make your system functional Absolutely. and effective? Like, yeah. um, you know, there's all this math behind understanding and like the science behind what we do. But I think the important part is both understanding it on like a scientific level so you know how to read the data and make decisions, <laughs> but also knowing the effects of right like yeah. you don't necessarily need to know it's like well if i add one millisecond of delay here it's going to create a 1000 hertz ohm filter so i better <laughs> make sure that's out of the operating range of my system and blah blah well it's like well, no i know if i do this thing you know the opportunity to have something that's been tuned for you during nightclub right going around and you're at the mercy of whatever's in there a lot of times you know but you kind of you kind of have to. Just, I've always had to use my ears in my rooms. Well, that's I mean, it's yeah. always yeah. goes back to that. But, but there's well, also okay, okay, the thing is that if you're if you're going into someone's house, you can't exactly go into their system and correct things. I don't even ask. But them the cool system thing system is that yeah. a lot of these tools now is you can like you could you'll go into a venue and you'll hear some like. Like let's say the one of the boxes in the system is out, and you're like, oh, like I stand right. here and the left side right. sounds right, and I stand yeah. over here and there's something weird going on right. on the right side of the array, and that's something you hear, but you may not necessarily know what's going on, but right. you can actually I'm measure sure. that with right. your tools and then be like, and then when you tell the right. house guy, hey dude, I think your uh, high drivers are out on the right side of your PA, like they're three like, boxes down, yeah. and they're like. What are you talking about? And you're like, look, I have yeah. the data right here right. to prove that now we need to fix this. Because, yeah. I mean, so, going back to the whole like picking and choosing your battles, it's like sometimes you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to try and fix, right? Like, that are we going to have to yeah. call an entire crew of people in to like rehang the PA? Or are they going to try and crack the show because you told them something? Right. But then at the same time, like knowing what you have control over is important. Like if you're the headliner band and you go in and you go into a system and there's something seriously wrong with it, I think it's totally with valid within your 
um, it's totally within your realm to help someone and be like, no, let's make this right and fix the problem if we can, right? You know? Especially if it's ongoing and they have it every night and they don't even realize. Right. Just, and a lot of living people, with, a lot of people see out there. Totally. And a lot of people are like, oh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Amazing. So a couple of things. You guys, any more questions for Eric? Because we want to throw out a couple of dates. Now that we come back and we're going to talk about music. Oh, we have things coming up. Yep. We can we can get right. kids so that people from home can can see too. Yay! 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 Feel free, like if you guys want my contact info, I'm happy to like answer questions or like send some of this links to you guys. This yeah, is this um is there a place where we can like give you if we're like out of state or not at home where we can like give you like our email address to like get this PowerPoint and then to be able to like contact you with any further questions after reviewing it on our own. Uh, so was that, was the question, uh, how can you give me your contact info so you can ask questions later after looking at the PowerPoint? Yeah. And like in order to get the PowerPoint and everything too. Yeah. So the deal with the PowerPoint, uh, I don't know if you guys heard it earlier is that like some of those slides are taken, like scanned from the book and I reference them, but I don't know if like legal, I, legally I could distribute them to everybody. Okay. Uh, so I can totally send you guys, I can send you out the presentation without those slides added. Um, and then I can get, and I can provide leaks yeah. to the like AES papers where like yeah. waves from sculpture technology is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. did you guys hear that? The Lending yeah. Library of Sound Girls has two no, no, copies no. of the book. So, the Lending Library, if you go to our website and put your resources, maybe materials, you can go to it. It has a list of the books that we have available. Awesome. Check it and fill out the application form. We'll send it to you in 30 days cool. to use it longer if no one else wants it. Did you guys so hear cool. this at home? Did you guys hear that? So cool. mm -hmm. There's a lending library <coughs> if you go to the soundgirls.org site. What's, what's the the oh, sound system optimization. It's deep. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's super cool. White one or the black and gray. But it's been around forever. that being oh, said, oh, Yamaha's book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I highly so recommend funny. if you read right, Bob's book like really to also like cross reference and read like like read the paper on wavefront sculpture technology with Bob's book and like read some of the other because some of the writers, you know, Bob's a Meyer guy, so he's going to come at a lot of this information from his perspective, working with a lot of their technology, just in the same way the, the paper by the Elacoustics guys has a lot to do with, like, their technology. So it's, I think, really cool to read all this different, in all that different information and cross-reference it, because you can see where stuff overlaps and where they differ and, you know, there, bring your critical thinking skills into play to sort of like get what you need out of it and, and you know, set aside the stuff that may not be uh, as accurate yeah. or you, for your system, for what you're, what you're working on. Yeah. yeah, or just stuff that's like specific to the wor stuff that they work with yeah. kind of thing. Do you mind that I put yeah, your email? Yeah, yeah, so please, there's my home. email address. Erica Rust, A-R-I-C-A, O-U-S-T, at Gmail. And I'll wait for her to have your email. And I'll send, I can send out oh, an yes. email with, yes. uh, I'll put a link to a Google, to the Google Doc thing. Cool, I'll that, make a new version. Things. Yeah. Oh, very cool. And send it out Please, to you, everyone. Nice. You guys, there's something really cool coming up. November 10th, Music Expo. Louis Mastriacci, I can't say his name, He's good. there's a lot of letters in it. He's, he, he puts this on every year. Music Expo is November 10th, it's a Saturday all day, and it's over at Expressions. They use Expressions in all the rooms there. I know, good times to go see it. But this year, 
Sound Girls has one of the rooms. Oh, that's great. So maybe it, a little presentation again at that because you get a huge amount of people from all over. But we thought in, in the rooms, you guys, the rooms, we're going to have all different types of little workshops and stuff, and we're getting a booth on a little table. So it'll be fun. It'll be really good. Lots of different people go to this thing. I think last year there was about 450 all total, all day. Yeah. He does them in Boston, Miami. Nashville. Nashville and San Francisco. Who is yeah. he? Lloyd, Lloyd, he works for Twitter. He's actually kind okay. of a, a what's, his, what's his, his title? I can never remember Lloyd's title. He's, 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 he's not a way up muckety muck, but he's like deals with a lot of their getting the Twitter name out there and, yeah, and other social much. media. He's very, very, very big part of that. But then he started this some time ago and this is his main baby, but he's part of the audio engineering society planning group for the Bay Area that I'm part of as well. So a lot of times we're partnering up different things with Sound Girls and all these people are so open with Sound Girls because she's made a ton of connections. <laughs> Gary's made great connections Yay. out there. We've got lots of manufacturer yeah. connections. Oh, and and if anyone wants me on a panel, mm -hmm. yes. really wants to increase women. Yeah, he's great. Structure. Yes. So we've been working with him. We worked on Boston and Nashville. Well, Nashville's coming up and Miami this year. He's great. There's also volunteer positions too to do yeah. other things, but I think we'll be pretty busy if we've got a room and, yeah. and a booth too, which is really and I, and our members can attend for free. So yes, that's awesome. Yeah. Darn. So, it's fun. Like last year, there was Piper did a couple mastering things. There was one on archiving. There was Isotope it's, came and did a, a plug-in presentation. It was all kinds of stuff. It was, it was really good. It was really interesting. Where does it Keyboard, look, some manufacturers there. Yeah, Expressions, Memory Golf, yeah. Which is, it's good to carpool over there. There's not a ton of parking. Where is Expressions from? It's in Emeryville. Yeah, Emeryville, close to, I mean, it's kind of in between a couple of things. It's not easy to park over there. But they have the Emory Bay go round, the bus that goes right past the Expression. Good. I'll have to ask you that then, because that would be good to put out. Oh, there's Chris. Hey, Chris. What else? Hello. Uh, tomorrow, there's. Oh, a, yes, this is the online class. Yeah. So tell them about it, honey. I'm going to write it up here. Do we so, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I have to work in the morning. I'm okay. going home tomorrow. Okay, so the online class. Um, okay, there's an online class uh, webinar tomorrow being offered by the Production Academy, which uh, the guy Scott that started it, he's. Had a whole series of videos for people starting out, um, but he's doing a webinar with um, one of our members, Amanda Davis, tomorrow. She's a house engineer for Janelle Monet and uh, Tegan and Sarah. Oh, nice. So it, I haven't seen it, but it's going to be a question and answer format. And he's just interviewing her. So Sounds normally, great. it's only available to his the people that have signed up for his online courses. But he's offering some girl members to attend for free. Okay, oh, so, great. So oh, cool. that it's I believe it's three p.m. Okay. our time. I think it's six p.m. Eastern time. Oh. Um, if you go to either of the Facebook pages, and for you to register okay. on there, you have to register, and then you get the link. Okay, and that's register at, at the Sound Girls page or at it's Production okay. Academy. Bo, uh, you need to go to our Facebook pages, okay. and it's in events, and then the cool. information's in there. Okay. Soundgirls.org, you guys. Facebook page, yeah. events the, section. Yeah. This sounds great. It's yeah. just going to be fun. Of it too. They're good videos. I've watched a few of them. They're, they're yeah. useful. Excellent. They're very useful. Very cool. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. I very much. Yes, it's great. It's I know. Great. We had a, we have a, yeah, I don't know if she's online, but we have a 15 year old member now too who heard about it. She wanted to join Learn awesome. About Sound. Trey, I don't know if you're out there, but if you are, hello. I'm so, here. Hey. Yeah, I love that people can come in from everywhere. For yes. This. Yeah, it's really cool. Online hey there. There she is. You guys did. Hey there. Here's one of our newest members, everybody. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what else we got. Party. Oh, I'm working with that band tomorrow. I'm loading them in. And then I 
All right. Any, any more? Should I say? Should we say goodbye to everybody at home? You guys, we'll put the, we'll send everybody out the information that Erica had when she, when she's got the link already. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll send a little list of all these things too. Good to see everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dana. Yeah, thank Erica, you so thank much you. for coming. Thank you. It was thank awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. Great job. Bravo. Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Dana, for setting up the Zoom here for sure. Thanks, Chris. I'm glad you guys could see the board because I needed to know that. I wasn't sure if it was going to come through. Yeah, no. There was a different mic function. I figured out how to switch back between it, back, back and forth between it quickly. Oh, so excellent. Now, now it makes sense. Right on. But yeah, good session. Thank and, you so much. And the board didn't read backwards, right? Like it did to me. It didn't read backwards. It's a light, uh, it's a lighting thing. Lighting based. thing, got it. So what you would probably do is I'd put a scoop light above it next okay. time for that kind of thing. Good idea. Yeah. Thanks, son. Awesome. Yeah, well, How's Colorado? It's awesome. Yeah. Have a great, great time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So right. good. But Erica, great job again. Bravo. Yes. You guys, right. bye everybody. We're gonna bye. we'll put some links up in a little bit. But thanks for joining us. And oh, I'll let you know, I think we have another meeting coming up in October. But I'll uh, no September. Sorry, and I'll let, I'll send it out to everybody. Cool. Brienne says thank you. Hi, Brienne. To everybody. Erica, thank you. There you guys go. Hey, Carrie. Thanks again. Bye, Anne. All right, Carrie. I'm gonna say you can wave goodbye. Say bye, everybody. Bye. I'll stop recording.